You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you all? Are you okay? Oh, I don't know. As I'm recording this, I've got the children home on school holidays. I've got the person who lives opposite who's just having some structural building work taking place. And my husband has put on the washing machine and the dryer. So I don't know. I don't know how this episode's going to work, but we'll give it a go. We'll, we'll see what happens. Do you know, I was talking to the kids about in my day and I remembered how when I was young, I was only allowed to watch three TV programmes in the evening. And so instead of choosing the ones that I liked the most, the cartoons, that sort of thing, they were always the shortest ones. So I ended up having to watch things like News Round, even though I didn't want to, but just because they were the longest ones. Honestly, the youth of today, they, they don't know. Did you have that sort of imposition on your TV watching? And you would just hope that they would forget and um, it would get to the third thing that I'd watched and the credits roll and just there trying not to even breathe thinking have they noticed have they noticed i'm still watching the tv and of course they had never got away with it but but anyway what a what a cruel childhood that was <laughs> or not um anyway we've got some great books to talk about today well we've got some brilliant 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 books some good books and some okay books so the, you and then you need to hear what I'm saying and try and work out which is which. I think that's what we can say. And we've got a really interesting author to talk to today, something a little bit different as well. That should be quite intriguing. And uh, we've got a book box opening, <laughs> I'm afraid, for those of you that can't bear it. Honestly, I keep getting so many messages about how you love it. So, uh, yes, you've got another book box opening at the end. But first, we need to go to our lovely Facebook group, People are reading, which is great. Still reading. Um, David is uh, still valiantly reading I Follow You by Peter James. Lauren is reading All That Remains by Sue Black. Uh, Wendy's reading The Lake by Louise Charland. Joe's reading The Secrets of Strangers by Charity Norman. She's not sure about it yet. Sue's reading Inheritance by Jenny Eclair. I need to read that. And reading Win by Harlan Coburn. I've got that and I need to read that. Uh, Julie's reading Two Wrongs by Mel McGrath. Of course, we had Mel on recently. Mark's reading Lock of the Dead by Oscar de Muriel. And uh, it turns out that the author uh, had, to, had some correspondence with Mark about this, had to Google him. Very nice eyebrows. Anyway, there we go. Uh, Laura's reading Knife Edge by Simon Mayo. Of course, we had Simon on some months ago. Um, Janine's reading The Whole Truth by Cara Hunter. Love that book. Absolutely love that book. And Joe is reading The Stranger Diaries by Ellie Griffiths. Absolutely love that one as well. Leslie's reading Innocent by Erin Kinsley is pretty good so far. Uh, Hyde is reading Mexican Gothic by Silva Moreno Garcia. Uh, Liz is reading Victim 2117 by Yussi Aldler Olsen. Zoe is reading Gargoyles by Harriet Mercer. And Rowena is reading The Gift by Louise Jensen and can't put it down. So there we go. Quite a selection. You'd be very welcome to join us. Just go onto Facebook and type in Quick Book Reviews Podcast. So let's get on to the books. What books am I talking to you about today? Well, I'm going to be talking to you about Someone Who Isn't Me by Danuta Cott, The Bird Watcher by William Shaw, Blue Lightning by Anne Cleves, Version Zero by David Yoon, Don't Touch My Hair by Emma Dabiri, Not In My Name by Michael Coolwood, and Phase Six by Jim Shepherd. Yes, I know, another huge amount of books to talk to you about, but some I really want to focus on. So, Someone Who Isn't Me, let's start off with that because we're going to be talking to Danuta about this book. It's actually the second in the series. I haven't read the first one, which is called Life Ruins, but I, I really enjoyed it. I didn't feel that I was missing out. Probably I did miss out on knowing some of the back plot, but I, I enjoyed this from the first chapter. It's different to some of the other books you might read. So, it's just um, sort of flagged that up, but it's a, I thought it was a really good, tense read. Anyway, here's the blurb. Becca's had a hard time of it, but she's finally got her life together. She has a nice little flat, a steady job pulling pints, and she's even seeing someone new, Andy, who keeps his private life to himself but is always good for a laugh. And then Andy vanishes. When his body turns up on an isolated, sunk island, Becca learns Andy wasn't just another punter. He was a police officer, deep undercover, investigating a drugs ring that he believed operated out of Becca's pub. 
Staggered by the betrayal, Becca turns to the only person she thinks she can trust, her foster mum, Kay. But Kay has problems of her own. She's just moved into a short-term let in the hopes of finding some peace and quiet. But peace and quiet are hard to come by on Sunk Island. Before long, both women are drawn into a terrifying world of drugs, money and death. I do think that gives too much away in the blurb, I've got to say. Um, but it, never mind that. It's a good book. And I do want to go back and read Life Ruins. I thought it was well paced, good characters. As I say, it's different to some of the other crime books that I've read. Um, but let's talk to Danuta now because this, this lady has a story to tell. So Danuta, thank you so much for joining me today. I really wanted to talk to you about this, this great book, Someone Who Isn't Me. Uh, uh, it's the second in the series. Yes. Um, and that's, I suppose I have to ask, what made you want to, to write this series? Well, I love Yorkshire. I mean, I live in South Yorkshire. I'm a Yorkshire woman. And I have friends and family on the East Yorkshire coast, in the East Riding. And it's an area I love, but it's also a desperately poor and deprived area. I mean, Hull, um, Bridlington, Scarborough, they're all terribly run down. Uh, and it's full, of, it's full of all sorts of interesting places that people don't really know about. And I just thought I would like to set a book there and kind of let the landscape to a certain extent shape the people. Yes, and it, the landscape in a way is another character in the book. It it is, yes, yeah. And so, uh, I mean, I hadn't read the first in the series, but that, that wasn't a problem. You're very forgiving with your readers that you mm. can enjoy the book just as much without having read the first. But I was interested, when you when it's a series, is it harder coming back because you've got to remember all the backstory? Or is it actually easier because you're it's like putting on a comfortable pair of slippers? It's a bit sort of swings and roundabouts, really. I mean... Under the name Danuta Ray, I, I wrote four books set in Sheffield and South Yorkshire, and they were all stand, linked standalones. Um, so this is my first try at a series, and I thought it would be a lot easier because by the second book, your characters would be well established. Yeah. And that was, that was true enough, but I did have to remember a lot. Um, I hadn't really kept enough detailed notes I have now I'm not making that mistake again and I had to keep whizzing back through the first book to think oh goodness is that right and when did that happen and uh, you know um, and also it was important to, it was important that the book would work as you say as a standalone so people could read it without reading the first one but it had to it had to refer back so you get that sense of continuity um, and uh, that was something that I found quite tricky. I kept writing reams of explanation of what had happened in the first book and then pressing the delete key and, you know. <laughs> um, you yeah. Loyal readers, you know, adding on to the characters and giving them more. But as you said, you, you don't want to discourage people from just starting at the second book, mm. doing it, what it, what it is. Yes, yeah, some of the series I've enjoyed, I started sort of in the middle and then read my way backwards and then yes. forwards yes. again. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. And in some ways, that's even more enjoyable because then you think, oh gosh, that's that's why that character's like that. Yes, and yeah, it, yes. It reveals more. I thought the first chapter, particularly of this book, was just extraordinary how you're immediately involved in this situation with uh, Andy, the, the policeman, and, and all that he was experiencing. Did the book always start with that as chapter one? Yes, um, it doesn't always work like that, but I had this scenario in my mind and I wrote it while it was still there. And I thought, yeah, this this has to be the opening to the book. And it stayed. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. And thank you. Me, um, the book, when well, it revolves around a lot of different themes about identity, I felt. Mm. Um, the identity of where you belong in location and family and your own identity and strength was that sort of deliberate or is just that that just happened with all that the book contained yeah that's that just happened and I think because the two central characters uh, Becca and Kay are both characters in transition I mean Becca from 
uh, an abusive home and eventually being taken in by foster parents Kay and Matt, and Kay being the foster mother who sort of effectively saved her. Um, and Becca's still got a hell of a lot of learning to do. She's still very angry. She's still spiky and aggressive. And she still um, undervalues herself. Um, I used to teach in further education colleges in South Yorkshire, and I met so many teenage girls like that, you know, um, who were constantly sabotaging their own lives because they undervalued themselves. And Kay, who's much more confident and got a much stronger sense of self. Bef about a year before the first book, Life Ruins, starts, she loses her husband, Matt. So she's coming to terms with living on her own and trying to work out how, how she can be the single person, Kay, when she's been part of, if you like, Kay and Matt for a long time. So they're both in transition. And as I was writing the book, I realized that these transitions and for the other characters as well were, were driving the plot on in a way. And that's where the title came from. I thought, yeah, you know, someone who isn't me, this is, yeah. And in terms of the, the pace and the plot, again, I don't know how authors manage it, but you, you kept me wanting to read, but you didn't exhaust me. It's that fine balance. Oh, good, yeah. How, how do you manage that? I like to move between um, point of view characters. Um, I think that can be risky in that if someone's really enjoying one thread and suddenly they're behind someone else's eyes, they think, oh, you know, so you, you need to kind of keep moving to make sure they know they can get back to their uh, and hope that they will start liking the um, the character they're with as much or enjoying it at least. I think as well that when you build up the tension to a certain point, you then need to relax it. There's two ways you build up, relax, build up, relax, and then, you know, hit. Yeah. Um, but once you've done the hit, you really need to step back. A book that's constantly at a peak of tension all the way through, I think you almost lose it. And you, you, you can take it to the point when you're getting a bit farcical and you think, oh, sort of not another disemboweling. Can we sort of, you know... Uh, yeah. Uh, you get a bit more blasé about what the, the serious events in the book. Yes, I think you only want a small number of, of bad things to happen, but you want someone in the environment where these bad things are threatening. It's that balance between lots of action and, and believability. Yes, yeah. As well. It, uh, reading your books uh, or reading this book, it, it just struck me, it feels like writing is very important to you. Um, very important, yes, yeah, yeah. It's something that you've done for for a while. I've I've written all my adult life. I didn't actually write something that was publishable until um, I started writing crime fiction. And the reason I'd never tried crime fiction before was I didn't think I could think my way through these complex plots. You know, um, uh, but I I just started off with an idea which was based on something that happened to me um, and having written that I realized I wanted to know what happened next and the only way I was going to find out was, um, was to write the book <laughs> and uh, you know the, the, the problem of thinking up puzzles and, and um, you know because the good whodunit obviously good characters good plot you want all of that but people expect to be presented with a puzzle they don't want uh, to know they they, they, they like the reveal in a way yes. and so it's important that you do that and that's what I thought I wouldn't be able to manage but it kind of developed in the course of the plot and sometimes I surprised myself um, and if I'd be writing and sometimes think oh, that's what happened you know and, and I, I love those moments um, you know they're worth all the struggling when you're staring at a blank screen and and nothing but drivel sort of pours out yes, there's those good moments when you think yes you know, the parts of someone who isn't me, though I had the broad plot in my mind, um, when they when they happened, it was that moment of, oh, that's what happened, um, you know, uh, and um, I hope that if it surprises me, it'll surprise the readers. <laughs> that's wonderful, though, when a story just takes you over. And... Oh, it is. It absolutely is. Yes. Yeah. And so this is the second one. And um, I believe you, you're 
in the middle or working through the the third in the series? Yes, um, I'm sort of about two thirds of the way through it. Um, yeah, but yeah. Um, life has changed. It seems a, a, a little bit recently for you that the, uh, the the third book may not come out quite as you had thought it would. Yes, that's um, a hazard along the road for any writer. Um, I was taken on by my publisher, by an editor who absolutely loved the first book and was very invested, in, particularly in Kay and Becca as characters. Um, and she was massively enthusiastic about, about them about, and about the whole series and my plans for it going forward. But unfortunately, first of all, she was on maternity leave uh, for part of the time while Life Ruins was being prepared for press. I mean, great for her, I'm saying unfortunately for me, I'm being very selfish there. Um, but so I worked on someone who isn't me with an editor who wasn't so invested in the series. She did a good job of editing it, I, you know, no complaints there, but I didn't have that feeling of rapport with her that I had with the first editor. So I was really glad when she came back, but she came back basically to serve out her notice. She was moving on and had she gone to another publisher, I would have gone with her, but she was moving on to become an agent. Um, and so suddenly I was left at my publisher without a champion really. Um, and they decided that they don't want to take the third book in the series. And I kind of feel as though, you know, a series is something that grows and develops. Um, you know, you, you hope with each book that more people will come on board with it, but it's more, it's more than just the second book to get it going. And I do feel very shortchanged by that. I feel as though because there is no one in the publisher now who had that investment in me, they, you know, they've, they, they just want to sort of move on from it. That must have come as quite a shock. It did, yes. Yeah, it was, um, it was a difficult thing to take on board. Um, but that's that's how it is, you know, you, you can't scream and shout about it. Oh, well, we can always have a good scream and shout, I think. <laughs> Behind closed doors, plenty yeah. of screaming and shouting went on, actually. But yes. <laughs> and that's fair enough. But I think it is important to consider this, that, that, you know, so often, certainly when I've interviewed authors, we've talked about the, the progress they've made up to getting published. And it mm. all seems as if once you have a, a publishing deal, that's it you're you're made for life but mm. it's not actually like that no it absolutely isn't these days in particular when I was first published most publishers had a wide range of authors some of whom were mega bestsellers but most of whom were what we call mid-list authors it's not a term I like it sounds a bit disparaging but those who appealed to a smaller number of people but yeah. often had a very faithful following in them and I think as long as the publisher is making a profit from these sales, I do appreciate their commercial organisations. I much prefer that because you get a much wider variety of books. Indeed. Yes. Whereas now there's an element of one size fits all. And what they want are the big bestsellers. They're not really very interested in nurturing writers and developing careers. They like to take on new writers because new names are exciting. But my goodness, if you don't fulfill within the first couple of books, then they will discard you. Um, you know, the, it, it's, it can be quite a ruthless business, unfortunately. And I think that's sad. I think it's very sad. I think we're losing a lot of good writers um, simply because and sometimes some of the most interesting and innovative writers are not attracting the big markets you know because they're experimenting they're pushing the, the boundaries smaller publishers are often a little bit braver with taking you know taking those on and I think it it, it makes being a writer um, a tough world you know mm. if you love writing you'll do it anyway but it can break your heart sometimes it really can well we all love a good twist but not when it's your actual career that's the subject of the of the twist that's yes the, yes yeah that's what we want so what are your plans now hopefully you haven't thrown your um keyboard away and, and refused to to write anymore what 
what's the plan? I'm going to um, get the next book in the series into a probably incomplete but very accessible form. I don't normally sort of deal with all the editing issues until I've finished, I, I get to the end. I'm going to sort of quite closely edit the start of the book where I'm perfectly confident that this is how it would have gone through right, you know, if I'd finished it and see if my agent can interest another publisher. And then if another publisher does want it, I can, I'm, I'm in a good position just to go ahead and get it finished. Um, so that's plan one. Plan two is that I have had a book which is not a crime fiction novel in my head for a long time that I would like to write, but I haven't had time to because writing crime fiction to contracts um, means that obviously that has to be your main focus. Um, and I'll probably write a few more short stories. I've won a couple of awards for short stories. Um, I've won the Crime Writers Association short story dagger twice. Um, I, li I like short stories. I just don't write many of them because I don't get ideas easily for short stories. I think they're, they're tough things to write. In a novel, you've got a bit of space you know, to move around in a short story. It's tight as anything. Um, and uh, so when I do write a successful one, you know, one that actually comes together and works, I think, yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> so. And what can we do to support you as, as listeners, as uh, readers? What can what can we do that might help the situation? Best thing you can do to support any writer, two things. One is buy the book if you can possibly afford it. I always say to people, a paperback is lunch out and a cup of coffee mm. and it contains no calories and lasts much, much longer. <laughs> and uh, Kindle version is even cheaper if you like reading ebooks. You know, that's the best support you can give to a writer. And the other thing is, if you like a book, review it. Put a review on Amazon, uh, even if it's only a couple of words, preferably not unmitigated bilge. We prefer it not to be that, but you know, um, <laughs> yes, give it a review on Amazon, give it a review on Goodreads. I could say a short just a couple of lines. Um, the more reviews a writer gets on Amazon, you, yeah. you know, it'll appear sooner on 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 the on the pages, mm -hmm. and those are the two most important things I think readers can do to support writers: buy their books, review their books, and spread the word around. Um, yeah. Yes. And even if they're um, reading the book from, um, they borrowed it from the library, still mm. go on and leave the reviews. That's Absolutely. Good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm. So that's what we need to start focusing on for you. Let's build the support. Yes, yes. I mean, I know not everyone can afford to buy books and libraries are a real godsend from that point of view. Um, if your library doesn't stock it, ask them to yeah, be the squeaky wheel. Keep asking for the books you want. <laughs> yes, well, that's great. I mean, if you could go back in time, is there anything you'd, you'd have done differently ab about this book, knowing what you know, if you had known what lay ahead? Well, there is. And when I was writing this book and just before someone who isn't me, as no, um, Life Ruins, the first book in the series came out, my husband was diagnosed with terminal cancer. We didn't know how long he had, but we thought we had a good year. It was very early stages um it could have been operated on if he didn't have other health problems that made the surgery too risky well terminally risky uh, they didn't want to operate and he didn't want them to do it he said he didn't want to die in hospital post-surgery um so you know and i really worked hard on getting someone who isn't me finished and thinking as soon as it's out of the way we can spend this time together and unfortunately, by the time I'd got it finished, he was he was much iller and there was so much that we couldn't do that we could have done. Um, and yeah, he died a few months later. Uh, I guess I was thinking about my having something that was important to me after Ken was gone. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. I mean, you've gone through so much and then to not have the the next book sort of automatically renewed that's um 
it's just sort of one punch after another, really. I'm, I'm really sorry. I hope you don't look at the book now and, um, and feel regret because this is such a wonderful story. Um, I feel very proud of the book that came out of it. It, I'm very pleased with how it turned out. I, you know, I think yes, it, it is. It's, it's the book I wanted it to be. Um, and I dedicate it to Ken, and I quote one of his a bit from one of his poems at the beginning. Was tough, yes. Was Ken very interested in your career? Was he, you know, did he support all that you did as an author? Is that oh, he was. He was. Uh, yeah, he he was. He was so pleased when I first got published, and he was absolutely delighted. He loved the books. I mean. He doesn't really read fiction much, but he read all my books. He uh, he bought me coffee every morning when I was writing. Um, he would listen to me bouncing ideas off him. Um, yeah, he was absolutely delighted to have a wife who was a writer. You know, he, he totally enthusiastic for my career. Uh, he couldn't have been more supportive. Um, yeah, so so yeah, that that was that was great. Yeah. yeah, I remember him at the launch of Life Ruins. He he was not too well then, and we were at Sheffield City Library, and someone found an armchair and put it at the front. Um, it was kind of set out cafe style, and he sat there in the armchair with his glass of wine, looking so <laughs> pleased. <laughs> oh, wonderful! So, what would what would Ken's advice be to you now if he was sitting there with all, with all of this going on? It would be to keep on writing and, you know, um, yeah, yeah, keep so, fighting, keep writing. Yes, yes. So that's that's what I do. Wonderful. Well, we hope you do keep writing because uh, clearly you are a wonderful author and we'll do everything we can to support you. And Thank you. hearing about what's next and some and some positive news for you. Danuta, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Wasn't that interesting? I mean, wow, every author has a story to tell. But uh, I think this is just an extraordinary one um, and uh, very humbling, really. It does put things into perspective. Um, so, yes, that was uh, Danuta Cott um, about her new book, Someone Who Isn't Me. So let's go on from one good book to another good book. Oh, I love this one. This book is called The Bird Watcher, and it's by William Shaw. Now, I have uh, read and raved about William's other books. The latest one, I absolutely, I just thought it was incredible. The Trawlerman, um, really, really good. And this book, actually, I didn't realise when I started really reading William's, but the bird watcher is the first in the series. Um, and I loved reading it now because it just expanded the, the background of the characters so much. I'm really pleased I've read them in that order, actually, which is quite strange, I know. But it was just, it just gave me much more information about the characters and their background. And I was able to soak it up so much more, having got to know the characters and got attached to them. I mean, this is a 10 out of 10 book for me. It really is. Let's read the blurb on this one. Sergeant William South has always avoided investigating murder. A passionate bird watcher and quiet man, he has few relationships and prefers it that way. But when his only friend is found brutally beaten, South's detachment is tested. Not only is he bereft, it seems there's a connection between the suspect and himself. For South has a secret. He knows the kind of rage that killed his friend. He knows the kind of man who could do it. He knows because Sergeant William South himself is a murderer. I, I just thought this was brilliant. I did listen to some of it as an audiobook as well, and I thought the narration was superb of that. I, it's just a great book. This guy can write. I love his books. I love the characters. And with each book, I'm getting to know and care for them even more. I suppose a bit like Ellie Griffiths, and in, way, in many ways there are similarities, but they're not similar. Uh, that doesn't make sense, but it it kind of, it makes sense to me in my own little mind. It's a, it's a good book. I'm so glad I went back to uh, read this first one in the series. And, and now, William, if you're listening to this, please stop listening to this podcast and go and write the next book because I need to know so much more that happens. I really do. But I thought that was excellent. So that's The Bird Watcher by William Shaw. Next, we have Blue Lightning by Anne Cleves. Now, 
This book was recommended to me by a friend of mine, Rosie, who's actually a co-host on the Dum De Dum podcast. And she said I had to start reading Ankle's books and that this one, Blue Lightning, was the one to go for. Absolute best. And she was right. I have to give it to her. She really was right. It's part of a series, but I, I didn't feel that I had missed out coming to it. this one. Let's read the blurb. Shetland detective Jimmy Perez knows it will be a difficult homecoming when he returns to Fair Isle. It's a community where strangers, while welcomed, are still viewed with a degree of mistrust. With the autumn storms raging, the island feels cut off from the rest of the world. Tension is high and tempers among the trapped islanders become frayed, enough to drive someone to murder. When a body is discovered, the islanders react with fear and anger. With no support from the mainland, Jimmy has to investigate the old-fashioned way, and with no way off the island until the storms abate, he knows he has to work quickly. There's a killer on the island waiting for the opportunity to strike again. Um, I listened to this one on audiobook and let's just say I enjoyed it so much that I then found that you can order a, a sort of a box, a collection of the eight books in this series or the first eight. And I did that because I just thought, yeah, these, these are my sort of books. I love the setting on the Shetlands um, and I love how that changes how people feel and feeling hemmed in and how the weather can affect whether you can escape from a place or not. Um, and what brings people to a place like the Shetlands and what makes them stay. All these sort of things. Just loved it. Absolutely loved it. So would thoroughly recommend uh, this book. But yeah, Blue Lightning and Cleves, bring it on. Bring on the rest of them. I just need the time now to sit and read the rest of them. But it's great. I need to start reading all of Anne's books I think so that's that's another good recommendation now the next book version zero this was quite something um, and can I even find the blurb to go for this book yes I can right prepare yourself oh now I should say version zero is written by David Yoon and David is married to the author who wrote everything everything which I was a well it's a YA book and it's some time ago that I reviewed it oh two years ago year and a half ago anyway loved it um so I was very interested to hear what what David's writing would be like and uh yeah okay here we go Max is fortunate enough to be employed by Ren the world's most powerful social media company but one day he discovers something sinister going on beneath the surface of the company a terrible secret that makes him rethink not only his work, but also the true consequences of modern technology. When Max is fired from Wren for asking the wrong questions, he joins up with his two best friends to form Version Zero, a top secret group with a simple goal, break the internet and build something better and kinder in its place. Um, so I enjoyed this book because it's got all the elements that, that you like, the sort of the thriller aspect, the technology, the sort of reflection on social media and where we are at this point and where it might get to. Um, it's written in a slightly different style from that which I'm used to. So it either suits you as a reader or it doesn't. But I thought it was very compelling and I thought the story was very interesting and I just love the concept. So, yeah, this guy can clearly write and I look forward. Oh, I've got an itchy nose. Um, I look forward to reading more of, of his. So, right, let's get the next one because there's another book. There's three more to go through. I'm sorry about this, but there's a lot to talk about. So the next one, Not In My Name by Michael Coolwood. In an alternate 2003, the UK holds a referendum to go to war with Iraq and splits the nation with a 52% to 48% yes vote. A young activist is beaten to death after a demonstration. The police say her murder was random. It wasn't. More activists will be murdered. The activists only trust each other. Maybe that trust has already been betrayed. Witty, political and provocative. This new adult mystery is based on real events and keeps the reader guessing to the very end. Um... It's published by Claret Press, which is a, a new publisher for me, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fresh writing. I thought it makes you think about events and how something could change quite quickly and easily and who you trust. Um, and uh, it makes quite a quite a compelling read, 250 pages. Um, and just, yes, if you're wanting to read more that make you think um as i say and just look at events through a, a, a different lens then this could be one to consider the next one is called phase six by jim shepherd 
there isn't really a traditional blur but basically it's about 11 year old boy Alec and his best friend um, and they can they go into mountains to extract different things that they bring back to the village and it seems that they have bought in a virus that they were the initial uh, carriers of that virus and so there's the outbreak and and it just it creates a whole pandemic I mean who would have thought that who would have thought that this would be a book that uh, might really um, be a little bit too sensitive at the moment but it's not it's written in a way that I didn't think um, oh my goodness this is happening and this is how things could work out it was so different that I could read it and feel relatively comfortable about it um, but it's about how he sort of bears this crushing guilt and how the world's trying to look for answers and how the investigators relate to it. There's all sorts of elements to it. Um, and Jim, Sh Jim Shepard usually writes short stories. Um, he's an American author. And uh, so it's very interesting to read a book that's written by someone who primarily writes short stories. And, and that made it interesting as well. Um, so the, the sentence that uh, is given to it is this. A spare and gripping novel about a disastrous pandemic completed by the award winning Jim Shepard before COVID-19 even emerged. That reads like a fictional sequel to our current crisis. So, wow, he actually wrote this before. That's that's pretty incredible I think um so there we go that's phase six and then the next and final book you'll be pleased to hear but an absolutely great one is called Don't Touch My Hair by Emmy uh, by Emma <laughs> Philippa come on Don't Touch My Hair by Emma Debiri and this was a book I read as part of a the Lauren um Patreon group her book club um, and the book is about, oh, obviously from the title, Why Black Hair Matters and how it can be viewed as a blueprint for decolonisation. Over a series of wry informed essays, Emma Dibiri takes us from pre-colonial Africa through the Harlem Renaissance, black power and on to today's natural hair movement. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. I did feel some of the essays were harder going than others, but all of them taught me so much. And just about the styles that are used, about the, oh, just um, the pressure on certain hairstyles, the time that it takes, all sorts of elements. It's just, it's a, it's a great book. It's a hard book because it, this shouldn't, it's a book that shouldn't have to have been written in some ways. Um, because, you know, of racism and, and, and just way people are judged. Well, um, it, yeah, it, it was a sad book to read, but it's so powerful and gave me such a wealth of history of Afro hair um, and the research that she had done. It, it was it was very good. Yes, some of it was a bit hard to read in that it felt very academic, but on the whole, really good. And I'd say that was pretty much the conclusion of the of the book club as well. So there we go. I think we've covered an awful lot of books. Let me just cover the names again. Sorry again for the background noises, too many pieces of paper. So we had Someone Who Isn't Me by Danuta Cott. And gosh, Danuta had a story to tell us. Um, the Bird Watcher by William Shaw. What a book. Blue Lightning by Anne Cleese. Great book. Version Zero by David Hume. That was very interesting. Um, Not In My Name by Michael Coolwood. Phase Six by Jim Shepard and Don't Touch My Hair by Emma Dabiri. Now, I think that's everything, but we're just going to do this book box. So if you've had enough of me and don't want to hear me opening a book box, I, I don't blame you. Leave now and we'll meet again next week. Otherwise, hold on and uh, I'll get the box. Right, so here we go. We've got a book box um, from the Book Box Club, funnily enough. It's this lovely sort of aquamarine bluey, greeny box. Let me move the pen from over there. Um, and I can't remember, I think this is March's box. So I have held off quite a while from opening it. Don't want to spoil anyone. Now, last month, I was a bit disappointed. It was all about tarot cards and witches, and which isn't my thing at all. So I'm hoping that this will be a better one. So let me just put down the, the lid of the box there. Right, here's the theme. Fingers crossed, everyone. Against the dark. Oh, yeah, I think this is... I think this is going to be quite good. So um, there's a cheat sheet at the top that tells you all the bits and bobs that are in 
uh, the box. But I don't want to read that yet because as the cheat name gives it away, yeah, I don't want any nasty surprises. I just want to know. Well, not nasty surprises. I just don't want to know. I want it all to be a complete surprise. So then I've got this envelope with my name spelled correctly again. We're winning. Uh, open me last. And that's the invitation to the clubhouse to meet the author. Next, we've got the book. The book is the next thing. And it's wrapped in this gorgeous silver um, ribbon and this lovely aquamarine paper that they use every time. It's quite a hard book. It's one. It's a hardback. The book is a hardback. I'm opening it now. I'm opening it quite slowly, I think. that's a, Sorry about that for all the noise. Oh, The Shadow War. Oh, The Shadow War by Lindsay Smith. Listen to this. Liam appeared to be in total control. He was confident, calm even, despite the strangeness surrounding them. He was just an ordinary college student, a little dishevelled though, nothing that couldn't be fixed by a hot bath. His tweed jacket, his satchel, his tidy leather loafers, nothing about him hinted he could unleash hell from his palm. But Daniel was used to monsters that wore the plainest faces. In the distance, something howled, slavering and cruel. What is this place? Daniel asked again, though he wasn't entirely sure he wanted to know the answer. This, Liam said, is how we're going to win the war. <gasps> this looks so good. I mean, it, it looks like it's to do with um, uh, Nazi Germany. Um, a Secret War. Uh, this looks uh, like a really good book. I don't want to read too much of it now, but this uh, this is going on my pile to read. I like that very much. Now, let's look what other bits and bobs we've got. OK, this is an interesting... This is a piece of wood. <laughs> it's a piece of wood with a beautiful picture. Oh, and just one more chapter. Is that a bookend by any chance? I am going to look at the cheat sheet for that. It is a bookend. That's clever. So it's got this beautiful picture. Uh, it does remind me of when I was young, younger. Um, a girl with a torch trying to read her book late at night. And that's exactly what I used to do under the duvet. Just one more chapter. So it's one bookend. So maybe next month there will be the next bookend. I actually like that a lot. So that's very good. Um, yeah, that that's excellent. What else do we have? Oh, oh, wow. Great. So it's a tiny book light. So it's one of these lights that you can clip onto your book. Um, so you don't even need a torch. This is purple and I can clip it on. The, the really tiny book light clips onto your book. You can read in the dark. Fantastic. Yep. I'm, I'm up for that. That's good, actually. Um, now, there's a little tin. I'm presuming this is lip stuff. It's got a book on the front for the book thieves, it says on it. Use regularly to help heal and soothe lips. And it's got beeswax in, cocoa butter, grapeseed oil, peppermint. Mm, this looks very interesting. So I'm just going to read a bit more information on this. So for the book, these lip, lip balm by Mad About Nature. Slather your lips with this minty vegan lip balm and feel instantly emboldened and ready to take on the baddies. Let me have a smell. Oh, yes. Um, I don't need to pretend. <laughs> I don't need to pretend. That smells lovely, very minty and nice and vegan as well. Fantastic. I'm trying to be vegan as much as I can. Chocolate, mm, chocolate hasn't won me over. I've gone vegan for the milk and the sort of vegan for butter and some of the cheeses. But um, Cadbury's dairy milk just need to go vegan, please. That would that would help me an awful lot. Right. Well, anyway, what else have we got? We've got a few things here. So I'm going to get out. So one is a necklace. Sorry, let me get rid of all these paper little bits. One is a, oh my goodness, that's that's absolutely beautiful. It's a leaf, which sounds like oh, why have you got a leaf on on a necklace? But it's sort of silver. The necklace is silver, and it's got a leaf coming down, and it just looks very natural and pretty. So I really like that one. Leaves of Lorien necklace. <gasps> Here's your Lord of the Rings inspired necklace. Oh, my goodness. I went from really liking this necklace to absolutely loving it. Oh, that is fabulous. Wear yours with pride as proof of your place in our bookish fellowship. Yes, please. Thank you very much. That is extraordinary. Um, and then we've got something that's talking about an, another book, uh, like a, a, I call it a sales aid. It's not. But if stories open the door to other worlds, then books hold the keys. Um, and it's they're talking about The Absolute Book by Elizabeth Knox, a spellbinding mix of Susanna Clarke, Neil Gaiman and Philip Pullman. Oh, well, that does sound quite interesting, actually. Um, then we've got some more marketing 
bump so we'll we'll move on from that and then we've got like a notebook um stranger things notebook ah oh, use this notebook to keep track of your otherworldly abilities um, a superhuman ability to consume books totally counts or simply write lines. I must not open the gate to the upside down over and over. Oh, that's fantastic. So I haven't watched much of Stranger Things, so that's my fault. But I am certainly aware of it. And I think that's great. I love that. You've got the, the boys on their bikes. You've got um, the camper van coming down and it actually shows you what's under the ground as well which uh, doesn't look too pretty, shall we say. Oh, my goodness. And the necklace. I'm really I'm a bit overwhelmed. A Lord of the Rings necklace. I think that's fantastic. So I would say that's an absolutely brilliant haul. We've got the torch lamp, the bookend, the book that sounds really good, the lip stuff, the necklace. Uh, winning. I am winning today. So there we go. I think I've waffled on enough. You've been very patient with me. Look after yourselves and I'll talk to you again very soon. Take care You've now. Been listening Bye-bye. to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.